Over the last three weeks, Iraq has witnessed some of the bloodiest fighting since the end of the war. We were with Scotland's soldiers during this time. This is not a film about politics, nor a film about rights or wrongs. The crowd turned quite nasty and started chucking bricks. This is a film about the lives of a Scottish regiment in Iraq, the Argyll and Sutherland Highlanders. Apparently it was fired at us, not in the air, it was actually fired at This is a film about the boys in Basra. It's the early hours of the morning of the 24th of March. We're in Cyprus, bound for Basra. We're flying at night. It's safer. Less chance of being spotted as you fly into the danger zone. OK, lady, we've got 20 minutes. Stop the drop in Basra. But then something happens. Missile warning alert. Rear left. Flare suspense. Back of the map. And if we see another back there, tell us. Those alarms that you just heard were because our plane had apparently been shot at as we were coming into Basra Airport. The captain said that it could well have been uh, a missile, but he wasn't sure. Luckily, the plane's defence system kicked in and we landed safe and sound. The lads from 3 Platoon have just picked us up and they're uh, travelling back down to Riverside with us this evening, uh, where they're based just northwest of the city itself. The camp we were heading for, which holds 16 of the men, was a 40-minute drive through desert plains and police checkpoints. It's 7 a.m. For now, things are peaceful, and the men from 3 Platoon are waking to another day of routine duties. Riverside has been their home for the last three months. Halfway into a six-month tour of training up the ICDC, the Iraqi Civil Defence Corps. The first task for Lance Corporal Raymond Ruin is to get the Iraqis motivated. Come on, hurry up! Hurry up! Eventually, all his pupils arrive. My name's Lance Corporal Brown, and today what we're going to go through is an individual search, OK? I appreciate that a lot of you have been in the Iraqi army, OK, for a lot of years. Right? Lance Corporal Ruin is a veteran soldier. Well, I joined the army in 1992. Um, I was actually brought up in care. What I'm going to teach you today, right, is all new. It's the techniques that we use in the British Army, OK? All the boys that I was at school with, I brought up in care. They're into drugs, uh, or they're either in jail. So I think for me individually, Best thing for me was joining the army. Don't worry, go straight on up, OK? Grab the guy by the balls, OK? Because you're prone to get a sore face if you do that. The soldiers have a wide range of tasks to teach the Iraqis. Teaching them patrol skills, VCPs, searching individuals. Right, OK, I want you to just imagine, right, that you've carried out a search on this bloke, OK? And you've just found this gas plug, OK? Hightower, one of the Iraqi jindis, the lowest rank of soldier, hasn't quite mastered the technique of arrest. It's more, more now instead of showing them what to do and teaching them, it's more sitting back and seeing. We try to keep away from them as much as possible so that we can see what it would be like when we are not here anymore because that's what we want to do. Some of the others, however, are quick learners. Good, good. As Lance Corporal Ruin is busy being arrested, on the other side of Riverside Camp, Three Platoon's new officer, Johnny Mackley, is meeting local tribal chiefs. So first of all, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Captain Johnny, the 1st Battalion of the Argyle and Southern Highlanders, which is a Scottish regiment. A year and a half ago, he was a fish farmer. I was a kind of environmental scientist for a fish farming company um, based in the Inverness region. Um, so it's quite a transition joining from that going into the army, and it wasn't long ago at all, probably about a year and a half now, um, having finished my training and whatnot. So. We are here to help and teach the Iraqi Civil Defence Corps. I'm in charge of my platoon, but then I'm in charge of um, an ICDC company as well. So within that, obviously, I've got to train the ICDC, I've got to discipline the ICDC, and then um, I've got to teach uh, the ICDC command structure as well. So it's, it's a varied job. Um, his job today is to explain to the local tribal leaders exactly why the ICDC needs the training it does from the Argyles. Okay, just a bit of background on the ICDC. The ICDC was set up 
um, to try and develop a safe and secure environment for Iraq to rebuild itself. But despite reassurances, it's clear some of the chiefs need a lot of convincing. Britain is here 110% to help the people of Iraq. There's, that has never been in question. He says we don't see that. Why, why do you not see that? There is no oil. Benzene map. No fuel. Gas map. No kerosene. I mean map. No security. We don't have. Okay, I think what you have to understand is that Iraq has been under Saddam's regime for some 30 years and has spiralled into a height of depression. The British forces have come in here and they have they have a massive problem to try and fix. You know what we've noticed now is that people now have a choice to do whatever they want. Okay, unfortunately, you have to be patient. We cannot rebuild Iraq overnight. The tribalism of Iraq is one of the biggest challenges that Captain Mackley and his team have to face. The whole culture is underlaid with, you know, tribal rivalries and loyalties. But it is, it's probably our biggest concern, without a question of a doubt. And the, the, the biggest thing for us is obviously trying to get in a, a credible command structure. You have the moral strength, you know, to, um, to overcome that problem. Today's meeting comes to a friendly, albeit inconclusive end. Suspicious tribal leaders were almost inevitable. A few days before we arrived, British troops in Basra were caught up in rioting by men who had failed to get jobs with the local customs police. It was the sort of violence that Corporal Alec Irvin, or Heavy as he's known, was expecting to find on this tour. I was, I was a bit apprehensive coming here. I thought I never knew what I was coming over, now, the, the job I was coming over to do. Uh, so I was crap myself before I was actually coming over. But they're certainly get a, getting a bit more hostile, I think, the people of Iraq. Look, another week there, there's, there's 10,000 people looking for jobs. But we can't just turn around and say, right, here there's a job, there, there's money. You know I mean? So I think that's one of the reasons why people are getting hostile. An increased threat of violence meant the camp was now on high alert. That afternoon there was a troop briefing on threat levels and recent car bombs, or VBIEDs. There's been four confirmed VBIDs in Basra in the last four days, and this has been an ongoing problem, as we all know. Um, therefore, we want to try and restrict our movement in and out of Basra. OK, it's, it's a bit of common sense. The more movement we have in there, the, likely, the, the greater likelihood that we'll have a, a contact or get bumped. Our first op is going to start tomorrow. It's going to be called Op Deimos, and that's going to be a 40-hour VCP operation. And what that's going to consist of, there's apparently a 40-hour uh, Hajj religious festival coming up in the next two days. And they're very concerned that there's these infiltration from the Iranian border, extremists and terrorists and whatnot, trying to cause disruption in the Basra region. And that mainly takes the, the form of VBIDs, vehicle-borne improvised explosive devices, and also um, transportation of weapons and other um, illegal objects into Basra. Given their orders, the ICDC and the jocks prepare for the 48 hours ahead. They head off on Route 6 to start the first of that day's VCPs, or vehicle checkpoints. It's a chance for the Iraqi Guard to put into practice what Lance Corporal Ruin has been teaching them. Are they searching individuals here? Yeah? <laughs> Hightower's searching techniques are certainly better than his earlier arrest attempts. And have these guys found anything during any of the... Uh, the yeah, we found, um, found quite a lot of uh, illegal weapons. Everyone is allowed to have at least one weapon with them, but they're not allowed to transport them. Um, within Iraq. If we do get caught, they have to have a weapons authority card. But we've found quite a lot of people without these cards, so we obviously just confiscate the weapons. That checkpoint over, we set off to visit another one the ICDC should have set up. But they're not where they're supposed to be. The problem is these guys can't map read. They should be about four kilometers up that way. So we're gonna have to move the VCP, and we're gonna have to move it up there four kilometers. In the Saddam regime, they were deliberately taught not to use maps. So they couldn't disclose any information. So it's you know a big learning curve as well, trying to teach them how to use maps. And uh, unfortunately, it's a bit of a, well, it's taking a bit longer than we actually expected to do so. With maps checked, the ICDC head off, hopefully in the right direction. Four kilometre, that way. OK. We carry on with our patrol. Suddenly, a report comes over the radio that a car has just been held up at gunpoint and stolen on the main route into Basra. This is a prominent area for carjacking, it's called the deep. As you can see, it's really exposed, so it's a great place for the carjackers to go. This happened just a few minutes ago. Well, I think so, yeah. Captain Mackley questions the man who's had his car stolen. 
there were two. Were there two pickups um, involved in the carjacking? One pickup. One pickup. Yeah. And how many men? How many people were on board? Uh, four Alibaba. Four Alibaba. Yes. And what weapons did they have with them? Yeah, one in the. You have a slash. You have a slash. I have a slash. Uh, what are clashing cough? What are clashing cough? Clashing cough. Okay. What what we'll do is we'll get on our radio, okay, and we'll call forward to other call signs, other VCPs. And we'll try and stop any vehicle which matches the description that you've just given me. Okay. What I'm concerned about is, do you have any idea where this car will be heading with the, with the yeah, stolen vehicle? Yeah, yeah. Anyway, in that direction. Okay. Right. Thanks a lot for your help, anyway. Captain Mackley radios ahead and alerts other checkpoints up the road, but carjacking is so common in Basra, it's unlikely the thieves will be caught. As we moved on, I watched the way the soldiers interacted with the locals and realised the role of the Scots wasn't just guarding and policing. Living and working with a frequently hostile population, the soldiers are encouraged to present a friendly face to win over hearts and minds. Obviously there's a language barrier there, um, but I try to get conversation with them, something that we might have in common. Um, and the way I find it is we'll have something in common is by football. Who do you like? Do you like David Beckham? Beckham. Beckham. How about Glasgow Rangers? Real Madrid Beckham. No. Glasgow Rangers? No. Ali McCoist? No. No. It's good when you're out as well on patrol to keep the kids around you. So it's just for a safety. I mean, because no, nobody's going to contact you if there's kids around you. I know it sounds quite cool, but it's just something they have to do. Ali McCoist, Glasgow Rangers? No, no. No, no, no. The operation carried on through the night. The cover of darkness is when terrorists are most likely to try and cross the border with weapons. The men know they can't let their guard down. In the daytime, this area is so flat that you can see the checkpoint from Marlow and you can just turn around and run off and zoom off. So it's quite good at night, you know, they just turn around the corner and suddenly they're in a checkpoint, there's nothing coming in to stop and get searched. So. But then that, that uh, by itself makes it slightly more dangerous. Of course, the, any, operating at night is obviously far more dangerous, yeah. You don't know what's out there and, uh, you know, the people the element of surprise react differently, obviously, in there, yeah. But despite the dangers, the ICDC still make mistakes. Just had an incident back there. Just the lieutenant uh, came up to me and said, Johnny, uh, can I have a word with you? I said, yeah, no problem. He said, is it OK if you go back to Riverside? And I went, why? What's the problem? He said, uh, I've forgotten my rifle. In the hurry, he got in his vehicle and left his rifle. So, bit of a drama. You know, if we did that in the British Army, we'd get in a lot of trouble. And to be unarmed in Iraq at night isn't ideal. That gunfire. Yeah. That's gunfire. And you normally round about these parts, um, a lot of the times come out and uh, just fire, fire, regardless of shots up in the air. It's just, it's just the tribes. But not all gunfire was just up into the air. When we awoke the next morning, we found one of the other platoon's patrols, led by Sergeant Colin Young, had been involved in an incident overnight. When we got the brookie to book out, before we went out on patrol, we found out there was a, an incident involving uh, an arc call site. Uh, there was a couple of casualties. We don't know what, at the minute, exactly what happened. Uh, we haven't been told a lot yet, but there was uh, two casualties maybe taken to the hospital. We discovered it had been a rocket grenade attack on another Argal platoon based in a nearby camp. We travelled to meet one of the men involved in the firefight, Sergeant George Andrews, to find out what had happened. He took us to the site of the ambush. It was night time, about half past one in the morning, and we're transiting from Baruki, which is to the north of us now, to Camp Cherokee, south on Route 6. The fire came from the north side of the road, see some built up bricks, and that's where they used as one of the contact points. The ambushers then fired a rocket-propelled grenade at Sergeant Andrews' Land Rover. As we got our vehicle came up at this point here, the vehicle took about 10 metres to stop and it was immobilised just there. Back at camp, he described what had happened to Private Gary Hanna, one of the men in the back of his Land Rover. As he stood down, the RPGs hit there. And what's happened is there's metal seats in the back, just here and here. The metal seat, because there wasn't enough time for the warhead to arm, as it's hit there, the metal seat's been blasted in his legs. Chut him that way and he's fell down, unfortunately for him. Private Gary Hanna suffered severe leg injuries. We've had this uh, amputated it from just about there. He's got, he's got the full support of the British Army behind him. You know, he's got all the lads, he's got the regimental association. The guy's not going to want for anything, which is no little consolation, if any. 
the guy, but he's got all the back on watch. He's got a lot of good friends. Back in Riverside, news of Private Hanna losing part of his leg reached the other men. Just gutted for the boy, you know. Just end of the day, it's ruined, mer you know, more or less ruined, ruined his life. But see, I've been speaking to a couple of boys and he's still in high spirits. You know, but he's probably saying to himself, thank God he's still got his life. Mixed emotions. Emotions really um, makes you angry. It makes you apprehensive. Makes you um, scared in a way as well. Um, could have been me. Why did it have to be him? But as the news of Private Hanna started to sink in, back in Basra, violence was escalating. British soldiers have clashed with Iraqi civilians in the southern city of Basra. Details of the incident are still emerging, but it's believed that violence followed the disaster. Um, apparently, it was um, an Islamic group that had been squatting in the middle of Basra. British troops went in to move them out. They wanted to stay. It's all escalated from there. Despite mounting tensions, the Argyles continued with their patrol duties. But being out in soft-skinned Land Rovers without armoured protection worried the soldiers. Every time I, go, I come out in top cover, I always think that we're going to get a contact. I've always got the feeling that we're going to get attacked somewhere, but it's never not happened yet. So that's in the back of your mind? Yes. Does it frighten you? It does. In it does. It was a fear that soon came home. Get down there, get down there. Get down there. Come on, uh, There's just been a, a few explosions. We're not sure what it was. It certainly didn't sound like gunfire. Um, just yesterday morning, there was an RPG. It's a rocket uh, grenade which went off. Yeah, it was heading north, a pistol out the window, I think, doing that in the air. Um, I don't know if you heard that, that was a pistol out of the air, that's that's what the noise was. He never fired it in the air, he fired it at us. Apparently it was fired at us, not in the air, it was actually fired at us. Delta Zero, Delta Zero, this is Charlie One Zero, radio check, over. A gold line through the rear left hand passenger window. Other checkpoints were called, but the shooter wasn't caught. Luckily nobody was hurt. These guys do this every day going up and down this road and I can tell you sitting in the back of this, as much as you have all this on and you're with these guys, it doesn't make you feel that much safer. Once back at Riverside, Heavy decided to call home. Huh? Hello, how are you doing? Not yeah, bad, son, how are you? I know bad, what's been happening? I don't think they realise you know, how bad it is. There's a wee bit of trouble here, haven't What do you mean? I've just, they see a lot of things in the news, but there's a lot of things over here that don't actually, you know, sometimes don't get reported in the news. Don't tell me that, Alex. The quicker you get here, the better. But Iraq never left much time to think of home. Captain Mackley was soon caught up in a new situation. An ICDC guard had been caught thieving. This man, uh, about two days ago, we had some items missing from, the, from a Land Rover. Uh, we did an investigation and we found all the items in this uh, Jindy's locker. We did an investigation, obviously, and it was pretty obvious what happened, and he's claiming he found the items. Uh, we inve investigated a few other people and they, they claimed he'd actually stolen them, so we don't want people like that. We don't want people like that in the ICDC. But... Right, we'll go in the office, because we'll go in the office. This, this could turn into a bit of a nasty thing. Right, come on, me. You've got, to, you've got to explain to him, right, that we, after the big investigation, first we found the items in his locker, OK? And after four hours of questioning him, he came up with about five different stories that he's lying. If he was, if he was telling the truth, why would he have any reason to lie to me, OK? The final decision is you're sacked, OK? And I want you now to leave the camp, OK? It's quite clear-cut that you were the thief. The hardest thing is just the frustration of the job. They don't appreciate what we're trying to do, and it's just frustrating that you know a lot of us have sacrificed our going away from our families and our wives and children. You know, giving a lot of time to these guys. And often they just uh, throw it back at you, which is so frustrating, actually. The man was told never to come back. The following day, we awoke to bad news. Across the country, members of the banned Medi army were inciting violence in support of firebrand cleric Muqtada Asada. 
Basra was no exception. The men prepared themselves for another day of patrolling. But our first encounter of the day was an unexpected one. Well, we've just had to stop because there's been a crash and apparently one of the jindis, one of the ICDC soldiers, has just crashed the car right into that river. But not just any car. It was the ICDC's newest model and only a month old. Yes. Very quickly, the crowd grew bigger. With the tow rope in place, the rescue attempt starts. But the rope snaps, and so does the patience of some of the men. They just don't listen to you. The pure ignorant fucks. They are ignorant. They're boss. It's all the V-Bains, but all the older man's getting away. Messed her off. Eventually, the car was pulled out. Albeit a little bashed, it carried on its way. But the crowd didn't. Just after we pulled out, the camera crew had jumped in the first vehicle and I was in the second vehicle. Suddenly the crowd turned quite nasty and started chucking bricks. A couple of the lads got hit and uh, I got hit on the head. It just goes to show what can happen in a situation like that when there's just so many people. Rock throwing, though, was just the tip of the iceberg. That night, the situation in Basra deteriorated dramatically. The operations room for A Company began to receive disturbing reports from across the city. 21, 12 hours, one times blast bomb thrown at a call sign west of Blue 11. 21, 23, RPG attack, Bath Party headquarters. In the last hour, we've had, uh, we've had six attacks. Uh, Four of them were RPG attacks. The other attacks were a blast bomb, uh, whether that was a hand grenade or, or an improvised explosive device, we don't know. We want you to be going out on patrol uh, just around the streets on the outskirts of Basra this evening, but apparently Basra is on complete what they call lockdown, which means that we don't go in. Three Platoon only has what, what they call soft skin vehicles, which means that they can't go into areas which are under very high threat of uh, RPG attacks or, or any kind of attack. So it means that uh, we're having to stick to the outskirts for this evening. Uh, there's already been six attacks over the past hour, so uh, the threat of any other further attacks this evening is extremely high, and every single camp, every single military base is now on the highest alert possible. Despite the dangers, we headed back out on patrol. We've come to uh, a small village on the outskirts of Basra, and this particular village, we're told, is run by the Garancha tribe. Now, this tribe is thought to be responsible for some of the six attacks this evening. Now, normally, these vehicles would just drive through this village, but the, the threat, the risk of anything happening is, is far too high. So what the lads have done is they're walking the vehicles through, and that way, if anything does happen, they've got a much better chance of reacting much more quickly. Uh, quite fortunately, there's only been one casual, well, three casualties. Um, none of them life-threatening. So, um, it's, it's always a constant threat, and uh, it's always playing in the back of your mind. That's why you can't switch off for one minute. The troubles of Basra hadn't spread to the villages, but we later found out a soldier hurt in one of the attacks was a Scottish Territorial who lost an eye. The next day, more bad news from Basra. It wasn't just the tribe's people who were attacking the troops. Around a 1,000 Shia gunmen had stormed the governor's office. Even the Iraqi police had joined the rioters. In spite of the increasing violence, three platoon was assigned to escort refugees returning back from Iran to Iraq after decades in exile. But there were worries about the day's events. It's a different world altogether when you get here. After two hours of driving, we arrived at the Iranian border, a place which had seen some of the worst fighting during the Iran-Iraq war. These refugees had fled from Saddam's regime years before. Now, despite the problems in Basra, they were coming home. 
Our role is to just purely escort them. Uh, we pick them off the border, and then we'll escort them in convoy all the way to Basra Port, where the United Nations uh, repatriation centre is. Just protection, really, make sure they get there safely. The 37-vehicle convoy started on the trip back to Basra. But problems began once we hit the main route into the city, Route 6. It was like completely blocking the M8, with a lot of Iraqis unwilling to take orders. Eventually, the convoy got moving again, and Route 6 was cleared. But just as we went over the flyover, the captain received a call. A patrol just moments behind us was under attack. That's a, that's a contact just happened there about two minutes ago, Green 19. We just come over that bridge ourselves. Uh, another call sign had three rounds fired, none returned. So we just missed it probably by about literally two minutes. Three hours after leaving the border, we eventually arrived at the port. The soldiers heard of our narrow escape. Remember when they went by us? See very ice at uh, four spots at a bridge. Stand on a bridge to get contact. Two minutes after we went by him, did Oh, what? That's just news that the CO's rover group has been contacted as well. Um, RPG'd in Basra. Fortunately, no casualties. Um, I think his vehicle was uh, the front left hand side was hit. He's managed to limp home, but just going to show you from the commanding officers getting RPG'd. We left the port and the refugees safely. But later, when we got to the company headquarters, we arrived to find another patrol from the same company had just been in the most serious attack to date. These pictures of their burnt out vehicles were taken just hours after the Argyles had left the scene. The Land Rovers were completely destroyed, along with all the equipment which was left inside as they fought for their lives. Some had shrapnel wounds. I thought, this deep. One RPG is enough to destroy a vehicle. These soldiers were hit by 10 and petrol bombed by a crowd of 200. Their faces still streaked with carbon from the flames. They were lucky to be alive. The wagon flipped over, so an RPG must have hit the wagon. You okay? Oh, that's a good thing. Someone gave me that in the first day of the tour. That's my good luck charm. It's, a, it's an old coin. That's your good luck charm. After me, yeah. I'm going to keep this forever now. <laughs> These past two days have probably been the most dangerous two days in Basra since the end of the war. I don't, I don't know. Certainly since we've been here. In our three months, it's been the worst, yeah. <laughs> that's 24 attacks. Yeah, it's been quite nasty. I mean, another warrior had four direct RPG attacks straight on it. Five and ten on these two land rovers. You know, 24 RPG attacks. So yeah. With the most serious casualties taken to hospital, news of the attack affected the mood of the platoon. The mood, the mood, it is anger. Everybody is angry because in the rules of in the rules of engagement, we, we can't we can't challenge them until they actually fire at us. So we can't return rounds until they actually fire. Another interesting day in Iraq. It was clear the Argyle's soft-skinned Land Rovers weren't the best transport to use in times like these. Despite the attack, life for the Argyles carries on. It's back to patrols, back to vehicle checkpoints, and back to searching for Islamic militants and weapon smugglers, so necessary for the prevention of further attacks. The last 10 days with 3 Platoon has been an eye-opening experience for me. And whatever your feelings are about the British military being here in Iraq, one thing is clear, and that's that these guys are living under a constant threat of violence. I guess the big question now is whether or not the Iraqi Guard will be able to continue doing as good a job as these guys have been doing, or whether more and more Scottish soldiers are going to be sent over here into the fields of Basra.